we're Xanadu, and uh, like everybody else here, we're doing something different. Uh, it's great to have lots of different approaches. Uh, our mission is to build a quantum computer that is useful and available to people everywhere. And it seems like a pretty straightforward mission, but both those useful and available pieces are actually incredibly challenging. Uh, we work in a slightly different approach. Uh, ours is photonics, so using light. Uh, and that has some fundamental differences, advantages, and disadvantages. We've been around for a while, uh, founded in 2016. Uh, uniquely, maybe that we're a, another Canadian company located in Toronto. Uh, and today, I think it, it always changes day to day, but we're somewhere over 130 people, uh, mostly focused on hardware, but also uh, working on our applications and software stack, which is open source. And you can check out some other QEDC videos on, on Penny Lane. Uh, Photonics does offer some unique benefits, and probably the biggest one uh, is one that was just mentioned by Cold Quanta, which is this idea of scalability. When we're talking about scaling here, it's not from you know, tens to hundreds of qubits. We're really talking about scaling to millions of qubits. And it's because we need millions of qubits in order to be able to actually facilitate the truly transformative power of quantum, not the marginal quantum advantage uh, that we're chasing today, but really, uh, you know, using Shor's algorithm to break uh, encryption codes, that, that level of work. And uh, getting to that number of qubits, uh, we already are quite aware that all existing approaches are not able to put all those qubits onto a single chip. So you're gonna need to be able to interconnect chips together. And this is really where photonics shines, uh, mainly because the interconnect between chips has already been a somewhat solved problem for, for quite some time. In fact, the first quantum computers we stood up online with our X series, uh, GBS devices already were moving in quantum information uh, between two chips and actually two different rooms. Another really big advantage of uh, photonics is uh, room temperature operation. And you can really imagine the future where you have edge deployed quantum computers. But what it means today is that we're just able to develop a lot faster. Uh, our chips look very similar to the semiconductor chips that you have in your computer today. And in fact, we can use all the same infrastructure uh, to test and validate our designs uh, that has been developed for the semiconductor industry. Similar to that, uh, that, that same benefit of kind of being really compatible with the processes means that it's, uh, we're also highly manufacturable. When you think of that million qubit quantum computer, uh, it's gonna be many components, many chips. You actually need to be able to manufacture these at scale. You could have the best qubit in the world, but of course, if you can't uh, make it, uh, it's not really gonna be useful to anyone. And we're really lucky here in photonics that we're standing on the shoulders of giants, the billions of dollars that has been invested in telecom and datacom. Uh, and this really allows us to work with the largest foundries today. Uh, if you take a look at some of our announcements, you'll see that we already have partnerships uh, with folks that can deliver the volumes that you will need not only to deploy a single large scale system, but actually many. Uh, and maybe the last one is a little unique. Um, uh, our, our friends from IBM touched on it, but uh, clock rates will eventually matter in quantum computing. Today, they don't because we're tackling bigger challenges, but once you get to fault tolerant universal systems, uh, there will be a clock race. And the really great thing about the photonics approach is that the limit to how fast you can go isn't actually the quantum part, it's the classical electronics uh, that are controlling your quantum systems. Photonics is naturally broadbanded. We use it for the highest speed applications today, and that transfers over to move, working with quantum information as well. So our past was really focused on building the core components. Uh, you can think of it as maybe the transistors of our architecture and getting them to uh, quality and manufacturability that we can use for a broader architecture. Now in the phase that we're actually building the first module that can actually demonstrate uh, those fault tolerant pieces. And once we have that, I would say the engineering uh, work has been de-risked and it really turns into a manufacturing problem to deploy that large uh, scale data center. I'll briefly go over because it's a little bit different, uh, but it'll be really a kind of a high level uh, fly through of how this architecture works. If you're interested, uh, you can also check out our YouTube channel where there's a little explainer video. But basically photonics is unique in that you don't hold your qubits on the chip, mainly because they're made of light and light is continuously moving. So you actually are continuously creating and destroying uh, your qubits. And the quantum information persists because you're actually able to teleport it from one qubit to another. So one of the most important and probably one of the most difficult parts is actually making your qubits in the photonic approach. 
and we use this stand uh, state generation factory. And what it does is it uh, gets excited uh, with classical light. Uh, and what it outputs is a series of quantum states. Uh, squeeze states is what our old quantum computers uh, leveraged for GBS applications. Uh, but there is uh, more complex states called GKP states uh, that are, I would say, very robust qubits. Once they are generated, uh, unfortunately, these uh, really robust qubits are generated with probabilities that are a little lower than we would like. So you actually need to increase their probability by taking uh, many generating devices and multiplexing them, combining them together in order to increase the probability. This then allows you to move into the stitcher. And here you can think of as uh, the part of the quantum processor where we actually uh, generate all the entanglement. So all the qubits that we're generating in the layer above, and you can imagine each one of these sources putting out a qubit every clock cycle, we're now gonna stitch and we're gonna entangle them not only spatially between each of the qubit sources, but also through time. So a qubit that was generated on the previous clock cycle is connected to the one that follows it. And this gives us a very nice, large three-dimensional, fully connected lattice of qubits. And then simply to operate on this with any sort of uh, user program, all we need to do is measure these qubits in very specific ways. Uh, and uh, this can not only implement the user program uh, that, that we're interested in running, but also uh, all the error correction, all the diagnosing of potential errors to actually support uh, fault tolerance. And the great part about this is that the detectors that we need here are actually the same type of detectors that modern LiDAR systems use Again, fully manufacturable, um, uh, accessible technology. Uh, this approach in general is called measurement-based quantum computing or one-way quantum computing. Uh, it has really exciting possibilities in being able to push better error correcting schemes as well due to the much uh, deeper connectivity. Uh, but one of the maybe very important things to note is that from a fundamental level, it is fully equivalent to uh, the qubit on chip approaches once you're looking at a fault tolerant universal system. I'll pause there, but if you're interested in learning more, uh, whether it be to get access to our current devices, uh, whether it be to talk about our software stack or the applications work that we're doing, uh, I would be uh, thrilled if you reach out to, to my colleague Sean at sean at xanity.ai and really looking forward to the broader discussion.